Hello friends! Today, finally, we'll be talking about intravenous glutathione therapy. For those that don't know, glutathione is the body's main antioxidant and IV, both IV therapies, intravenous therapies that are done through people's veins, usually at clinics, as well as intramuscular injections of glutathione have become quite popular in recent years. I have some opinions about this subject, which I'm going to tell you about in this video, but before I do, please subscribe to the channel, like the video if you haven't already, and comment on the video to help the channel. Now let's get started. So to give you guys a bit of background, I've been quite averse to exogenous glutathione supplementation for a few reasons. The first reason is that glutathione is the body's most important anti antioxidant. And I had a concern that if somebody supplemented with glutathione on a frequent enough basis and already had a robust antioxidant defense system naturally, they might weaken their antioxidant defense system in the sense that their body may become used to this exogenous supplementation of glutathione and dependent on it somehow because our body has homeostasis mechanisms and is trying to control the total amounts of various molecules that we have in our body. But there were a couple of more concerns that I had with glutathione supplementation. The first one is that oral glutathione supplementation had had conflicting reports showing in some reports that it was not efficacious and in others that it might be. Anecdotal reports of people having their skin whitened from oral glutathione supplementation convinced me that it must be absorbable to some degree. And there are, in fact, clinical reports now that support the use of oral, particularly liposomal, glutathione supplementation. But the other form of glutathione supplementation that's most common is actually intramuscular injections. So there are a lot of um, quasi-medical establishments, either HRT clinics or vitamin therapy places that will sell you a bottle of intramuscularly or a bottle of glutathione that's supposed to be injected intramuscularly. These bottles usually have a milligram per milliliter dose that is quite low, like 200 milligrams per milliliter. And I've long been suspicious of two things. One, that th those doses were too low to get major benefits from the drug and that uh, really, if you were going to use those low doses, you'd probably be doing it the, the dosing daily and then to be dependent on this exogenous glutathione. But also that injecting intramuscularly, see the issue with antioxidants is that sometimes, and in the studies of glutathione, this is a question that's uh, contemplated by researchers. Sometimes the, if you have too high a proportion of antioxidants in a certain area of the body, it can produce a pro-oxidant effect. My concern with intramuscular injections is that this may happen where the glutathione saturates a little bit in the muscle for, for a short period of time and at that point produces a potentially oxidant, pro-oxidant effect in the tissue that's injected in. So that was a second concern. But I did always think that um, infrequent IV injections of glutathione may be beneficial. Recently, I tried one myself. And before doing so, I did a lot of research trying to figure out what the optimal dosing schedule may be. I was surprised to note that there are very few clinical studies of IV glutathione therapy. A lot of them, interestingly, are in Parkinson's disease. And that there are no long-term studies with glutathione supplementation. So my fear that we may become de dependent on it, we don't know if that's true yet, and it certainly may be true. Keep that in mind. In this video, what I'm going to do is review some of the outcomes of the research that I did before doing my own IV glutathione injection. And hopefully it'll be helpful for some of you guys in planning your own therapies if you do decide to use glutathione. First of all, I want to point you to a paper by Hong et al. This paper is very interesting. It shows that when uh, glutathione is injected inter intravascularly, IV, it is metabolized into glycine, cysteine, and glutamate. But what's interesting about it is that the antioxidant potential required from the glutathione, rather the amount of glutathione required to be in the body in order to attenuate the poisoning from paraquat, for example, are such high concentrations that the authors were led to believe that maybe some of the metabolites of glutathione were also active antioxidants that were playing a role in the effect that we see from IV glutathione therapy. And indeed, cysteine and methionine later downstream both have antioxidant effects that may be responsible for some of glutathione's effects because glutathione is rapidly metabolized. It has a half-life intravascularly of around 10 minutes. This is a bit similar to the antioxidant melatonin, which remains an antioxidant ac across several transformations in its metabolism which is one reason it's such a great antioxidant and can neutralize oxidative stress in even uh, the most uh, inflammatory diseases like ALS and Parkinson's disease. Now, I want to take a slight detour away from IV glutathione injections for a second. I wanted to mention that IV NAC injections, so for example, 15 grams of NAC given over one hour period, 
may increase glutathione levels in the body by up to or above 30%. In fact, in the brain, NAC injections can increase glutathione levels by more than 30%. So NAC injections can also increase glutathione levels, although oral NAC is much less successful at raising, for example, brain glutathione levels. Also, something I'd really like to ask uh, Derek and the guys at Merrick Health about is that uh, intranasal administration of glutathione is particularly a good delivery system for getting glutathione into the brain. Now, does oral supplementation with glutathione work? It seems to depend on the health of the individual. So, for example, in healthy volunteers, 500 milligrams of oral glutathione supplementation did not affect inflammatory markers in one study. In another study on patients with NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, those patients with NAFLD found a decrease in their ALT values, that's an enzyme that measures inflammation in the liver, from 300 milligrams of oral glutathione supplementation over a four-month period. Now, what about intramuscular injections? Well, 200 milligram intramuscular in injections, which is the common dose used frequently by enhanced athletes around the U.S., provided no benefit in one study for cirrhotic patients, patients with cirrhosis of the liver, that scarring of the liver. However, in a study on infertile men, both, all three, 100, 200, and 300 milligram doses of intramuscular injections of glutathione improved sperm parameters, but the 300 milligram dose was significantly more efficacious than the other doses, meaning there was a dose-dependent effect, and the 100, 200 milligram doses were subpar doses. Now, let's finally go over to intravenous glutathione supplementation, which is what I believe both the most efficacious and the most healthy way to go about it. Most of the research, interestingly, is on Parkinson's disease, although there is some research on skin whitening because there's a lot of commercial uh, interest in that subject, and there's a lot of research on avoiding acute injury, for example, from chemotherapeutics like cisplatin. But let's start with Parkinson's disease. In an early study, 600 milligrams of glutathione given intravenously twice daily massively improved symptoms in a case study on Parkinson's disease. A randomized control trial that sought to determine only the safety of glutathione injections in Parkinson's disease found that 1.4 grams of glutathione injection thrice weekly was safe and well tolerated even in Parkinson's disease patients. Conveniently, there's a case study using that exact same dose. In this case study on one Parkinson's disease patient, they used 1.4 grams of glutathione intravenously twice a week, then they escalated it to three times a week. The patient began to notice improvements in his symptoms within three weeks, and the improvements continued to escalate for a period of months, such that the patient's colleagues noticed improvements even in the patient's facial expressions. Now, what's all this talk about glutathione whitening or lightening skin color? Well, glutathione is very popular in the East in particular because of its effects, it seems, on tyrosinase, an enzyme that is involved in melanin production in skin. It actually may have a couple of effects on tyrosinase, some direct and some indirect via uh, reducing free radical expression in the skin, but the end result seems to be that glutathione supplementation uh, uh, directs the body to produce fomelanin as opposed to eumelanin. Next, let's talk about glutathione use to inhibit acute injury. So, for example, Contrast dyes used in some scans, that medical scans, can cause acute kidney injury called, called uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. So glutathione and NAC, IV injections, were compared. Three grams of each were compared to see their effect on inhibiting contrast-induced uh, kidney injury. The authors found that three grams of glutathione attenuated the damage, but three grams of NAC did not. Fascinatingly, a subsequent trial using 1.8 grams of glutathione was unable to inhibit the acute kidney injury from the contrast dye. So the three gram dose seemed to be quite important. Intravenous glutathione also attenuates the damage from chemotherapeutics that are used to treat cancer, like cisplatin, but also at these high doses. So at a dose of over 2.5 grams, glutathione can attenuate the damage from cisplatin, increase the excretion of platinum from the body, although it does potentially distribute the platinum at, uh, more, more thoroughly in the body because of this increased excretion rate. A final note from the research. If any of you are doing high-dosed vitamin C therapies, that's over 10 grams of intravenous vitamin C, following Pauling's thinking and maybe Walter Longo's suggestions recently. If you're doing that in order to kill cancer cells, for example, you're using vitamin C for the cytotoxic effect, effect it has on cells. So combining it with glutathione therapy may attenuate or inhibit the vitamin C's effect on cancer cells. 
So you don't necessarily want to combine high dose vitamin C with glutathione. They have different purposes. One is to reduce oxidative stress and the other is actually to increase oxidative stress, but particularly around cancerous cells. So what's the long and short of it all? Well, first of all, I think that oral supplementation of glutathione may potentially make you somewhat dependent on it. There are no long-term studies of it. Becoming dependent on an exogenous source of the most important free radical scavenger in our body is a little tricky. I wouldn't want to do it myself. Intramuscular injections of glutathione tempt you to potentially inject it so frequently that you may become somewhat dependent on it. So I also don't like that method of, in, of going about it just for that reason. But also intramuscular injections uh, localize the injection into the tissue in which the glutathione was injected and the antioxidant potential may be too much and too, uh, at too high a potential in that tissue causing potentially some acute damage. So I really think that intravascular injections are better and they're also better because it seems that lower doses of glutathione are ineffective. Doses north of one gram intervascularly seem to be the most effective. Now, personally, I'm not going to be using doses north of three grams because there is a risk of acute kidney injury from taking too much glutathione at once. So personally, I'll probably use between one and three grams sparingly on days in which I feel I may have extra oxidative stress and may need the help. I hope that was helpful for you guys and I hope to see you again next time. Have a great day.